Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm privileged to be here today uh, presenting our work on measuring the impact of host networking on traffic burstiness. Uh, this work has been done in collaboration with Seper Abdus and Dr. Suda Gorbani at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, so network traffic burstiness has been the uh, center of attention for the networking community because of its uh, important implications. Uh, first, it has been shown that the bursty traffic at long time scales can be predicted and accounted for. Uh, second, uh, understanding burstiness can allow us to tune network parameters such as buffer sizes. Burstiness has also been shown to lead to increased delays and loss for network services. Uh, to give a concrete example of the implications of burstiness, we investigate how bursts contribute to queuing delays in network switch buffers by performing simulations of a two to one in-cast traffic in a 40 gigabit per second setting with two types of workloads. Our results demonstrate that a workload that is four times more bursty results in 10 times uh, higher uh, buffer utilization tails, as you can see in this uh, CDF plot here. This is because the more bursty workload causes significantly higher fluctuations in buffer utilization, which in turn results in 10 times higher round trip time tails, increasing the overall uh, service response times. Another important property of burstiness is its scale, that is how burstiness is preserved through different time scales. If you look at the throughput of a workload at three time intervals, one second, 100 milliseconds, and 10 milliseconds, this traffic has a burstiness that is preserved through different time scales. Or in other words, this workload presents self-similar time series. On the other hand, the green traffic has a different burstiness behavior. Uh, it becomes a smooth at larger time spans. And this self-similarity property has implications on network design, like in buffer sizing. For example, if we plot the queuing delay of these two workloads under different buffer sizing settings, uh, where we increase the size of the switch buffer from 50 kilobytes up to two megabytes, uh, the queuing delay grows faster and is larger for the strongly self-similar traffic. That means smaller buffers are needed for that kind of workload to prevent large queuing delays. But what causes the traffic to emerge in bursts? Classical works show that the scaling of bursts is independent of the network stacks and is caused by the heavy tailed flow sizes. However, systems have changed a lot since then and so we have decided to revisit this question. Unfortunately, answering it is difficult since the host networking stack is complex. A wide variety of application workloads set on top of a complex set of network stack layers. Uh, in the transport layer, we have optimizations such as short queues and algorithms such as congestion control in place. Then the software scheduling layer performs pacing, policing, shaping, uh, and scheduling on buffers. Other software optimizations are also performed uh, on egress data until it is arrived at the NIC that has been known as a culprit for making the traffic bursty because of its offloading functions. Now all these layers are also tangled to a complex piece of software that impacts the traffic by performing process scheduling, memory management, and power management asynchronously. So we try to introduce a high resolution traffic measurement framework that attempts to answer this question. Our system uncovers interesting new insights about the dynamics of bursty network stacks, such as how lower layers of the stack can compromise the shaping efforts of the software. For example, when using a commodity multi-queue NIC uh, with TCP segmentation offloading support, we see no change in burst length uh, when we enforce TCP pacing. Uh, Valinor can also demonstrate how congestion control variants produce uh, different burstiness across time scales. Like TCP cubic results in a higher degree of self similarity compared to DC TCP or BBR. Our system reveals that even the choice of process scheduling matters 
uh, and as process of scheduling with coarse time slicing can lead to higher self-similarity. And finally, we investigate the impact of driver buffer sizing on creating bursts and show that the byte queue limits algorithm in Linux causes heavier bursts. Now, I'm going to talk about how we designed Valinor. So our first step uh, to capturing burstiness is collecting timestamps as well as a statistics about the traffic. This can be done inside the host machines or in the network. While doing this in the hosts enables us to observe the traffic that is generated from upper layers without relying on specialized hardware or software. Doing it in the network enables us to see the ultimate shape of the traffic on the wire and the aggregate behavior of burstiness, like its impact on buffer utilization. We combine all these advantages into our holistic uh, traffic burstiness measurement framework, Valinor. Valinor's measurement prongs are placed in the host networking stack and in the network switches. Uh, the host component is powered by eBPF to quickly and accurately capture the egress traffic inside the software packet scheduler. And the in-network framework is composed of a programmable data plane and a user space timestamp collection component. And finally, the offline analysis framework performs all the post-processing on collected data. The eBPF data plane of Valinor is invoked when packets are finally scheduled for transmission by the queuing disciplines. Its main functionalities are to filter the flows that we are interested in monitoring, uh, collecting the uh, transmission timestamps for them, and also collecting aggregate information about the traffic. To ensure that Valinor does not negatively impact the performance of the network stack, we designed circular buffers that are stored inside the Linux virtual file system. And then the control plane's task is to retrieve these timestamp records and store them in persistent storage. And also to make sure that the control plane is keeping up with the data plane, uh, we use a pipelined multi-threaded design that separates the polar threads from the storage threads. And this combined with the per CPU circular buffers and the increasing nature of the timestamps uh, realizes a thread safe shared memory between the two planes. The second part in the design of Valinor is the network component in the programmable data plane. The arriving packets are filtered first using match action tables. However, since most of the metadata for the packets are only available at the egress pipeline, the majority of Valinor's functionalities are implemented there. Valinor does not touch the contents of the original packets as they pass through the data plane. Instead, it creates a mirror of their headers, adds the timestamp and metadata information to them, and recirculates them back to ultimately forward them uh, to the collector machine. You can find more details about uh, how we designed and implemented Valinor in our paper. In this talk, uh, I briefly present the three highlighted results on congestion control, segmentation offloading, packet scheduling, and process scheduling. As you can remember from earlier slides, self-similarity is a measure of how much the traffic remains bursty across time scales. In order to quantify the self-similarity of a workload, we use the Hearst exponent, a statistical estimation that yields a number in the range of 0 and 1. The closer the Hearst estimate is to 1, the more it implies self-similarity, while lower numbers imply a non-self-similar traffic. In our previous example time series, the Hearst estimate for the self-similar traffic on the left is 0 0.6, and for the traffic on the right is 0 0.4. Now, I present three TCP congestion control variants in a two to one in-cast scenario, where two iperf senders that are connected to a single receiver uh, produce a traffic with map reduce flow size distribution, and this creates an in-cast on the receiving link with an offered load of 40 gigabits per second equaling the link capacity. The top figure presents the switch buffer utilization in a three millisecond time span. For Cubic, the default algorithm in Linux, packet drop is the congestion signal. Uh, that's why Cubic overwhelms the buffer many times during this experiment, causing an on-off behavior in buffer utilization. 
captured by Valinor's in-network probe. Cubic has a Hearst estimate of 0.6, a slightly self-similar behavior. We also evaluate DCTCP and BBR. DCTCP results in a Hearst estimate of 0.5, and BBR, trying to maintain a steady buffer utilization, results in a Hearst estimate of 0.4. And this difference that we can see uh, in the burstiness of congestion control variance uh, allows us to better tune network parameters, such as buffer sizes in the network, based on which congestion control algorithm we are using. Next, we investigate how lower layers of the stack impact the traffic shape. Linux stacks are equipped with a software packet scheduler uh, with several algorithms, such as fair queuing and FIFO fast implemented. The P FIFO fast class enables FIFO based priority queuing, while uh, the fair queuing class, the default scheduler in recent Linux kernels, enables TCP pacing and per flow scheduling. But software's decisions are not final because the packets then arrive at multiple buffers in the memory. Uh, and this will make the NICs the final entity to drain these buffers and perform segmentation at, at, on, on the packets to improve the throughput and reduce the CPU utilization. So initially, we disable the offloading functions inside the NIC and limit the number of driver rings to one to prevent the NIC from reshaping the traffic. We plot the complementary CDF for burst length under FIFO and FQ. The line that is rightmost uh, has longer bursts. So in this figure here, the FIFO scheduler that does not feature per flow queues is susceptible to creating longer bursts. However, as we enable the segmentation offloading for both cases, uh, the bursts become longer and the sh traffic shapes become similar to each other. This is also the case when we have a multi cunic without segmentation offloading or when both features are active, suggesting that the lower layers are compromising the software layers completely. Finally, we investigate the role of process scheduling in shaping bursts. Although process schedulers are not in the path of the packets, uh, their CPU allocation decisions may change the way packets are processed in the stack, as each layer requires CPU time to process the egress packets. We compare completely fair scheduler CFS, the default process scheduling class in Linux, uh, with the real-time FIFO scheduler. So we know C uh, CFS aims to share the CPU fairly among processes, while uh, the real-time scheduler strictly prioritizes certain applications as, and is usually suitable for short tasks. We plot the throughput for the network traffic at three time scales of uh, one second on top, 100 milliseconds in the middle, and 10 milliseconds at the bottom. When our cache follower workload is running alone in the system under CFS, the burstiness is low at different time scales as we calculate a Hearst estimate equal to 0.5 for it. However, uh, if we run a compute intensive application alongside our network application in the background, which competes with our network app for CPU time, CFS changes up its pattern by allocating large time intervals to uh, both workloads. And this creates a period of on and off in the throughput of the network app, raising the Hearst estimate to 0.7. Uh, a high level of self-similarity. Now, while this behavior can be potentially prevented by delegating our network application to the real-time scheduling class, we know that non-preemptive schedulers are known to be unsuitable for workload co-location, so uh, system designers will now be faced with another dimension in the trade-offs of designing process schedulers, that is the burstiness that they may cause in the traffic. So overall, uh, Valinor proves to be a useful asset for measuring the burstiness of network stack components. Our results show that the lower layers of the stack are compromising the shaping efforts of the software. As a result, existing countermeasures against burstiness are shown to be ineffective. Therefore, one suggestion is to push these countermeasures further down the stack, and in the future, a better co-design of networking stack functions is necessary with burstiness in mind. Uh, 
Valinor sources can be found in this provided link here, and uh, with that, I'm ready to take questions. Thanks.